about the cause-effect relationship. We, we see this correlation of symptoms with these infections, and how does it happen? That's a big question. And one path is inflammation, another path is autoimmunity. Talk about that, and then touch somewhat on autism, dementia, violence, and then a little bit on assessment, treatment, and touch maybe a little bit on the controversy. It's hard to avoid that. Uh, so this is a big opportunity. We really have an opportunity to correct a massive burden of illness, and we need to seize that opportunity. And early effective treatment can prevent a lot of suffering and disability impairment. And it's uh, tragic to overlook such a, a chance to improve life and quality of life. Uh, in different studies, um, and this is based on objective testing, when we look at chronic Lyme, the functional disability is as severe as chronic heart failure. The pain is as severe as coming out of surgery, and fatigue is as severe as multiple sclerosis with um, chronic Lyme patients. And this is a recent study with, uh, actually sponsored by the CDC, showing uh, the severity of um, uh, poor physical health and mental health with chronic Lyme, which is the blue, compared to other uh, chronic conditions. So it's quite disabling. That's a big thing about Lyme, is the disability that can appear over decades. And particularly with fatigue, sleep impairment, um, and uh, many symptoms that are quite disabling over time, which some people would call subjective, but it's a game of subjective versus objective. And it's just a matter of whether you know how to measure it or not. And a rheumatologist uh, who maybe isn't trained in certain areas doesn't know how to measure cognitive impairments in an objective way, whereas psychiatrists or psychologists can, uh, or to be able to measure fatigue in an objective way, which can be measured. It can be measured with brain imaging. So it, Dr. Fallon used an analogy of Lyme disease being like the story of Job, where everything seemed to go wrong, and maybe that was a good example. And notice all the fingers pointed about um, uh, blame, because we can't figure out what's wrong with you, so we are blaming you, okay? Now, part of the problem is how do you define Lyme disease? This is similar to the problem we had in psychiatry about 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we had three diagnostic categories, psychoneurosis, schizophrenia, and uh, organic brain syndrome. So I would talk about psychoneurosis, somebody else would talk about psychoneurosis, and we're talking about two different things. So we couldn't communicate information very well. Now with uh, what's called the DSM, and the DSM-5 is the recent addition, we've been able to perfect it and define it better, which helps communication. But these are all the different names that are applied to Lyme, and that adds to the confusion that there's not a consensus that uh, when someone says Lyme disease, what do they mean? And different people mean different things. Um, so what, what causes the psychiatric symptoms in Lyme disease? And uh, there have been people that have said Lyme does not cause any psychiatric symptoms, which I think is quite absurd. There's now 300 peer-reviewed articles in medical li literature documenting this in one way or another. And two studies particularly showed a pattern, and this is the most common pattern, and even though we see a lot of different um, symptoms, the more common pattern can be encephalopathy, and that's the cognitive impairment, the attention, concentration, memory impairments, um, and the fatigue, the depression, irritability, and two studies almost 50, 25 years apart showed almost the exact same things. So this was a study from in 1990 and you can see fatigue 74%, depression 37%, uh, irritability 26%, and then the cognitive impairments 89%. Another study done, um, and you notice Dr. Steer's name's on there. Um, another study done more recently by um, Dr. Shea also showed depression 37%, cognitive impairments high, he broke it down, uh, anger, irritability, uh, 53 percent, this was with children, so we saw a little more irritability with children, but we saw a very similar pattern, and this is the common presentation. One way to think of it would be like if you um, take 100 people, line them up, and then shoot them with a shotgun, everybody has a different injury. And, uh, but, so every Lyme patient is a little different with the cluster symptoms they have, 
for a number of reasons, but you do see common patterns that emerge. And Lyme doesn't help anyone. It doesn't improve the health of anyone, but it detracts from the state of health to different degrees in different individuals. So if we look at uh, the peer-reviewed literature, there's 8,000 articles on Lyme disease and um, more on other tick-borne diseases, and a lot of them conflict. And there's close to 300 now on persistence, proving persistence of infection is there. Um, there's 123 autopsies documented showing persistence of Lyme, uh, four psychoimmunology articles, and that's what I'll touch on, I wrote three of those, and um, as I said, 300 on psychiatric illness, 58 on dementia, which is quite significant, 30 on congenital Lyme. And recently someone in the media said, uh, Lyme does not cause uh, congenital problems, which you have to read. It's like a good comment by Dr. Phillips, it's not a religion. And now we have 15 on autism showing the link and five on violence. So if we look at, um, how can we explain it? So we, we have to look at a more complex model than was used before. And this is a model used by what we call Darwinian medicine. And Darwinian medicine is you have to look at how um, evolution occurs and that helps us to explain disease that can't be explained other ways. So you, there's a, this interaction of genes and environment. And part of the environment is infections or non-infections. So I'll focus more on the infections, knowing that there's other parts. And it, figuring out how disease occurs is like drilling for oil. Uh, you could have dug a hole 10 feet and gotten oil in Pennsylvania maybe many years ago. Now you have to d drill um, deep in the ocean. Uh, but so the easy diseases to figure out have already been figured out. The ones we have to figure out now take a more complex model. So there are multiple causes, multiple pathways of how it occurs, and multiple ways it manifests itself. And that's the way we have to think. We have to think in a different way than the way we used to. So we have to shift gears. Syphilis is a good comparison to Lyme, and syphilis really is a very simple organism with only 22 genes, whereas Lyme has 132. So it has much more sophistication, much more adaptive capability that allows it to survive better. And when we look at what happens to the brain, we see the sequence over time where there can be the early symptoms and then later symptoms. It can start with brain fog and then evolve on to more extreme things uh, decades later. Now, one way to think of it is there's three different kinds of ways that Lyme affects the brain. And this is an area of contention. Just because you have Lyme symptoms that affect mental functioning does not mean spirochetes are necessarily inside the brain. Sometimes that happens, but it can be vascular involvement where it affects the blood vessels to the brain. That's one form. It can be within the brain, and I can show, I'll show pictures of that, or it can be in the body and it then provokes the immune system. And that immune effect is what then causes brain symptoms. And I think that's probably the most common thing that we see. So one way to think of it is when you get an infection, part of the infection is a direct effect of the organism, uh, the infection on, on the host, but the other is how it affects the immune system, which in turn causes symptoms. And that's the bigger piece. And this is, we get into this argument of, is it an immune problem or is it an infection? And in reality, these immune problems occur because of persistent infection. So it's sort of splitting hairs. Now we know that Lyme can, th this is Lyme attacking a white cell and destroying it. And we can also see the same with brain cells on autopsies. Um, we, we know that there's this odd thing that occurs um, Let's say you get an infection tomorrow. Somebody sneezes on you. First, you get inflammation, and that's our body's early reaction to an infection. Then you get a shift, and after inflammation, you get adaptive immunity. Antibodies are made, and now you're fine, and it's over and done with. What we see with Lyme is there's a failure of that shift. So there's a persistence of inflammation because adaptive immunity does not occur. It seems like it just gets stuck, so there's ongoing infection with a failure of adaptive immunity. So there's this combination of both the inflammation symptoms and autoimmune symptoms that occur at the same time.
This is a newer thing that just came out about a month ago showing uh, the fingerprint in the immune system from Lyme disease. So we see with a lot of infections, each infection has a different immune fingerprint. And this, this shows the structure of it, which correlates with the Lyme infection. So there's a lot of um, evidence for persistence infection, and it seems like that correlates with persistent provocation of the immune system. With any, when you look at it logically, when with autoimmune disease, autoimmune, the immune system doesn't go crazy unless something provokes it. When you take away what provokes it, the immune problems end. So whether it's inflammation or autoimmunity, there's something provoking it. Infections are the most common thing, allergies, uh, and, but other things too. So now we'll talk about inflammation. Now, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because it's getting late and this is, I prepared more for uh, when I did a conference on psychoimmunology, but I'm not gonna, if I go into all the details of the immunology, I think I'd put everybody to sleep. And I might put myself to sleep, so I might fall asleep up here and that wouldn't be so great. So what I'll just say is, is that inflammation is one culprit, and there really is a lot of evidence that supports it. And there's a lot of different pathways of how inflammation can um, cause damage to the brain, be it from infection in the body or infection in the vasculature of the brain or infection in the brain itself. Now, one way is it, it has this fingerprint, like I showed that picture, and we see these cytokines. Now, cyto cytokines are these um, transmitters of the immune system. And think of how the brain works that there's transmitters, and it's almost like two parallel universes. One is neurotransmitters that we know about serotonin, dopamine, but there's also the, the transmitters involved with the immune system that also impact neural functioning. So there's this pattern that we see, and these are the transmitters that we often see with inflammation, with that early infection that persists, particularly one called interleukin-6 that is particularly high in Lyme disease, and that correlates with the severity of symptoms. So that's a marker of inflammation. Uh, but also we see what's called interleukin-10, which is immunosuppressant. Now think of it this way, when we um, did a military action in uh, the Gulf War, the first thing we did was knock out the radar, and then we came in for the attack. Now, that's also what microbes do. So realize this is a sophisticated organism that survived millions of years. It didn't have survived that long without adaptive capability. And one way is by being able to um, impair the adaptive mechanism, the immune system of the host. So another, uh, there's different components of, of the organism that then cause inflammation, and particularly brain inflammation, that can account for some of the symptoms. So that's one route. Um, they can go from the body to the brain and cause the brain symptoms. That's also occurring. We can also see that when the Lyme organism is in neural tissue itself, you can see destruction of neural tissue next to the Lyme organism. Um, and then other immune effects, um, the outer surface protein, the glia cells, Schwann cells, this is what Dr. Phillips was referring to, um, that that can cause uh, degradation of nerve cells. Now, another effect is a biochemical effect, that when Lyme is present, and then we see inflammation, and this occurs a lot with other infections too, like malaria, um, HIV, you see an increase of what's called quinolinic acid. And that what occurs there is um, tryptophan, which should convert to melatonin and serotonin, and that's a good thing, instead converts to quinolinic acid, which is toxic. So in a state of higher levels of inflammation, this opposite pathway occurs that has a biochemically destructive effect on the brain. Um, now, when we add this together and we look at these immune markers, particularly I mentioned interleukin-6, which is one of those uh, cytokines, that correlates with suicidality, it correlates with aggressiveness. In a, a number of different studies where they look at spinal fluid of people that are suicidal, we can see that that's higher. Uh, and we also see that these elevation of these cytokines, so this immune provocation, 
correlates with a higher amount of mental illness, intermittent explosive disorder, rage it correlates with hostility and risk cutting and fatigue. Um, we can also see that in this higher state of inflammation, you can see impairment of cognitive functioning. That's what we call executive functioning. Executive functioning is the first thing to go with Lyme disease. So executive functioning is the ability to create and sustain and monitor and regulate goal-directed behavior. So you can see an impairment in that in this higher inflammatory state. Uh, now this is a new thing that I'm looking at. And this is something I've been puzzled by for years. I've had patients describe, Lyme patients say that they have intrusive symptoms. And what are intrusive symptoms? How can you explain it? And here's a, a I'll give a description and then a couple others. So I'll read it out. Frightening, stabbing, horrific images, usually a death, dying, or pain and suffering, often gory and unreal as in a horror story. So it's almost like a clip from a cheap horror movie of chainsaw massacre or something that can be. Faces mostly with blood or terror exaggerated, awful expression, visions of stabbing or killing, often those close to you are familiar. Episodic, non-continuous, non fleeting faces, most usually of the worst possible situation. Helpless stump bodies, perhaps close to death. These images don't seem to necessarily be associated with a particular occasion place or time, but come and invade the privacy of my mind. I had one patient, and she would get a pattern where she would get a headache in the back of her neck, then she'd get the fatigue, and then she'd get these intrusive symptoms. These are other examples of intrusive symptoms, and I've had probably a couple hundred people with uh, these intrusive symptoms. I had intrusive thoughts of killing women with a knife or an ax. Then some mechanism in my head was telling me, kill her, kill her. Sometimes I had thoughts of killing my sister's one-year-old child or my mother. The patient had aggressive and homicidal urges, contrary to normal personality. She would look at someone and feel anger for no reason whatsoever. She looked at a woman in a restaurant and had an urge to hurt her. At other times, there would be sudden and unprovoked urges to harm family members. A patient described intrusive, overpowering, violent thoughts triggered by such stimulation, such as a dog barking, a bird chirping, a strobe light, or the presence of other people. There were also episodes of anger and urges to destroy, such as a sudden urge to rip the room apart and kill everyone and every animal in the house. Now, so what, what causes this? And uh, this seems to correlate with the severity of some of these infections. So, we compare this to post-traumatic stress disorder. With post-traumatic stress disorder, there's an intrusive thought. It's like, where did that come from? And we particularly think of a part of the brain that lights up on brain imaging. It's the amygdala and hippocampus. Now, the amygdala is the fear center, and the hippocampus is a memory center. So there, and this increases in a state of inflammation. And it also is increased by this interleukin-6 so these same neurotransmitters that are elevated with Lyme seem to push someone in this direction. There's also now a certain gene that makes someone more susceptible to it that's particularly prominent in women. Um, so we see these changes, then whether it's post-traumatic stress or these intrusive things without trauma, it's very similar. And treatment helps it and it can make it go away. So the people that had those horrific intrusive things improve from treatment and improve from antibiotics. So that's the anatomy of it. The hippocampus next to the amygdala, which lights up during a, like a flashback episode, like a war veteran would have. Now the other part of this is autoimmunity, where um, there's these, uh, the body makes uh, antibodies against the brain because the flagella or different parts of the bacteria have similarities to what's in the nervous system. And we see quite a bit of evidence that supports that. And that's similar to what we see like with pandas, pans. Uh, sometimes the onset of this can be abrupt. We also see it occur sometimes with certain tumors, particularly reproductive tumors. Um, so we see um, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence with antineuronal antibodies, antibodies against nerve cell that people have found. Um, so we have these multiple mechanisms of um, this immune reaction where the immune system attacks the brain because it is provoked by an infection. Uh, we also see what's called lipoproteins, where the type of fat cell, fat um, molecule, 
And then there's a crossover of certain molecules between uh, the Lyme and, and human cells so that that adds to autoimmunity and increases it. Um, so this is some recent thing. Now, if you look at it, there's, when we think of tick-borne disease or infection, there's a huge number of infections. So it's hard to say what a person has because Lyme is really just a marker for tick-borne disease. And every year there's a new, new infection that we find, so who knows what else? It's a, um, you think of ticks, they feed on rats and mice and, and skunks, raccoons, and then they take what's from their blood and inject it in you. So it's really kind of a toxic mix of who knows what. Um, now, besides Lyme, up to now, I was just talking about Borrelia burgdorferi, but we also see that other tick-borne pathogens also have immune effects that add to it and magnify it. So it's not just additive, but it, it compounds it where there can be immunosuppression effect and other immune effects from these other uh, tick-borne infections that people get. Now, autism, I'll say a word about that. Um, there is evidence um, that we see with an association with autism and Lyme disease. Certainly not every case of uh, autism, but it is, we do see cases where that's present, particularly regressive autism. And there's a lot of different patterns that could be seen, but um, we can see one study that we did recently is we found that reactivity on the 31 and 34 band particularly correlated with severity of autism symptoms. Now that's a problem because those two were removed in the, what's called the Dearborn criteria for testing. So that means that our current testing that's done with the common labs is blind to this which doesn't help in, in uh, it help, makes us overlook some of the cases that could respond most to treatment. Uh, so this is, a, this is an article which is not yet published where we found reactivity to those two bands in autism associated with Lyme was 92%. So it was quite high. Uh, it also raises concern about the Lyme vaccine but if you're given a vaccine that would be OSB or OSB, that's the exact bands that are going to be used. What might that do with autism? So that shows that. Okay, now dementia. Um, there's different kinds of dementia we see with Lyme. One kind is rapid, where a person just takes a rapid nosedive and deteriorates very quickly. The other is where it's more slow over time and can take decades. I think the slow over time is where it's more inflammation in the body, whereas the other is where it's actually the microbes in the brain itself and it's more rapidly progressive. Uh, violence. Now, it's certainly, a, there's a lot of um, evidence to pull together. For instance, in warfare environments, you see more infections in a war, people usually die more from infections than war, than uh, injuries. Um, and there are certain areas of the world, particularly Afghanistan, where you see a lot of um, infectious diseases that can affect um, mood and irritability, which, uh, uh, and it correlates with a poor environment. So poor environments are particularly conducive to uh, uh, more infections and, and violence. So. Um, one way to think of it is the brain is like a hierarchy of opposing circuits. So one circuit says attack and the other circuit says restrain. It's the balance. And it, the, the brain, as you go higher, you have the lower part, which is what we call the reptilian brain, the brain stem. There's brain stem rage, which is more very explosive. We call it reptilian rage. And then there's the mammalian brain, which is the limbic system that's more the emotional center. And then there's the cognitive area. So damage to these levels, different levels, can be associated with um, uh, different mental symptoms, including aggression. Plato, 2,500 years ago, described human functioning like a charioteer with horses. And it's a good way to think of how the brain works. So the charioteer represents your higher powers. And the horses represent your emotional capability. So the trick is bringing that, those horses, your emotions, into a balanced team. And sometimes we're trying to make the cognitive ability stronger. Sometimes we're trying to subdue the emotion. Whatever gets a balanced team.
So this breaks down some of the physiology, like with violence, where we're looking at different parts of the brain. Now what you find is an injury here may cause violence, another one here may cause violence. So why is that? Because there's these different loops that work together in unison. And if you injure an inhibitory circuit, someone would get disinhibited. Or if you injure empathy, there would be a lack of empathy and a person would be more callous. That would be a problem. But the brain has some ability to compensate. But So it's the balancing act. And we do see that with people who are murderers, we see two things if you go to death row. One is 100% of people there have brain injury and 100% have a history of abuse. Um, now, if you look at um, uh, infections, and I've seen this with Lyme infections, other infections, it's a balance of contributors and deterrents. Now, the more contributors to violence and the less deterrents, the more the risk is. And if you look, let's think of the different um, symptoms that someone might have. Um, for instance, the cognitive impairment. So a person is less able to stop and think and plan. That increases risk. Sensory hyperacusis, where like the dog barking and a person reacts, it could get violent. Decreased frustration tolerance, decreased impulse control, the intrusive symptoms, like I mentioned. Not everybody who has intrusive symptoms is violent. Most people don't. Most people can balance it with other things. But if you have too many of these things, then it's a problem. Um, altered sexual behavior, which can be a problem. Uh, some are hyposexual, some people become hypersexual. Um, homicidal preoccupations, mood instability, depersonalization, uh, detachment, dissociative states, paranoia, psychosis, social anxiety and social isolation, um, decreased bonding where a person doesn't connect and have empathy, um, and failure of facial recognition. That's something we always see with serial killers is they, every time you talk to them, it's like they met you for the first time. There's no continuity of connection to people. Um, and it decreased tolerance of the effects of drugs and alcohol. So the more of that, the more the risk factors are. So that's how we do an assessment, just like we do an assessment in suicide. Who's at risk for that? So when we do an assessment, um, we're looking at, is an acquired case of attention deficit disorder? ADHD is always there from birth. It's never acquired. If it's acquired, think of Lyme, think of something else going on. Regressive autism, particularly if it looks like autism with bipolar illness. Um, panic attacks lasting more than a half hour. Um, childhood bipolar illness. Um, progressive cognitive impairments with anxiety and depression. Uh, a progressively declining mental state. Um, and psych symptoms, what we often find is someone who's been partially treated for Lyme, it's enough to help the musculoskeletal things that are easier to treat, but not enough for the neuropsych. So is there a point where someone's health suddenly declined, followed by a fluctuating progression and development of multisystemic symptoms, including cognitive, psychiatric, neurological, physical, adversely affecting every part of a person's life? A big thing is no lab test can rule out Lyme disease. That is a very critical thing to, to know. So this is what... This is, I'm not gonna go through all the details of this, but this is how I do an assessment. Now this is what we were taught in medical school. In medical school, we would spend four hours doing an exam so that you had to do it very thoroughly. You had to take a thorough history and you had to do what's called a review of system and then a thorough exam. And that's um, medicine 101 is to be thorough. Unfortunately, people are kind of getting away from this. And this is classic medicine, how you're supposed to do things. So you go through each system, and it's very tedious and monotonous, but that's how you should do it. That's the right way to do it. What you don't do is a poor quality lab test and say, okay, it's not there. You have to do, go through this, and then you have to put it together. So the cognitive symptoms that we see are attention problems, uh, Increased sensitivity to sound, light, um, working memory problems, you forget what you went in the next room to get, sequential memory problems, uh, geographical memory, getting lost in the car, word finding problems, 
trouble with speech fluency where there's a uh, delay getting out what you're um, trying to um, say because you can't process and it's a white matter thing. You can't collect the thoughts like that, okay? Um, auditory, visual processing, um, writing skills, math, dyslexia like symptoms, brain fog. Um, and then we see the psych things, the irritability, low frustration tolerance, explosive anger, um, panic attacks sometimes, um, phobias, depersonalization, sometimes risk cutting. Uh, then we see other things where these are brainstem problems. Sleep, eating, sexual functioning, temperature, uh, fatigue, all those are, everything's out of whack. Um, this is before and after treatment. So you can see the left is what happens when the brain isn't active, it isn't working, it's offline. And then after treatment, and this person had um, 18 months of uh, IV rocephin, I think it took to get improvement, and now they're very high functioning. Um, and then we go through methodically all these things. So that's what you have to do. You have to go back to basics and do what we've done in medicine for literally hundreds, thousands of years is do a thorough exam. A lot of people get confused of what's psychosomatic. Psychosomatic conditions, you have your whole life. For example, if let's say I get headaches under stress, that's my pattern. Or diarrhea or constipation or something like that, or sweating or shaking. It wouldn't suddenly appear in midlife. It, it's, it's either always been there and that's your stress pattern or it's not. And if you have something that suddenly appears, particularly multiple things appear, it's not psychosomatic. It can instead be somatopsychic, where you get physical things and it bothers you, or it can be multisystemic because it's like it's a, something affecting the whole body, which infections do. Now, this is the notorious two-tiered Lyme testing, which is a complete disaster. Now, we think of this is like um, the, the two-tiered Lyme testing is, is like the sacred cow of uh, the Lyme denialist and. Instead of giving us a sacred cow, we instead get a bum steer, okay? <laughs> uh, now, if you look at the bottom, and this is on the CDC website, it says surveillance case definition is for disease reporting and should not be used as a sole criteria for establishing clinical diagnosis determining a standard of care necessary for a particular patient, or setting guidelines for quality assurance standards or reimbursement. That's what the CDC says. But apparently, people do not read that part, but that is the disclaimer. So it really is a very poor test with a 46% reliability by some studies. Now, think of it, this test is done Lyme tests, there are 3,400,000 Lyme tests every year. That means over 3 million times someone thinks this person could have Lyme. And yet, if you look at the CDC criteria, only 30,000 meet the criteria. So that's one out of 100, less than one out of 100. That's very scary that that Lyme test is that insensitive. Now, at least the CDC came out and said, well, we now know there's 300,000. So if that testing that is so entrenched gives us only 30,000 a year, and we know that at least there's 300,000 and probably more, uh, how much can we hang our hat on that? But yet, unfortunately, that's what your, a lot of doctors do. Um, another thing that's proof is that the Lyme does not cause immune memory. So you can get reinfected 20 times with Lyme disease why would you get reinfected? If you have the immune memory, you should never, if the immune system adapted, you should never get it again. You should only get it once and it's over. So that shows a problem. Now, people argue there's different strains, but there should be adaptive immunity. And there was problems with the vaccine because people did not hold immunity. They had to keep getting boosters. So should we follow the tradition of the two-tiered testing? Just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it is not incredibly stupid. <laughs> so how much weight should be given to the clinical assessment, which is what we've always done in medicine for thousands of years, versus some immune test uh, 
and a narrow definition of Lyme disease. So we have to individualize treatment. So standardized, evidence-based medicine, Hippocrates, Oster, emphasizes a thorough exam, individualized treatment, judgment, balanced weight, the best evidence available, clinical expertise, patient preference, to individualized treatment. But yet there's an effort to shift away towards more of a uh, cookbook type approach by some other way to make the diagnosis and treatment decisions. Now, this is a way that I kind of break down the Lyme disease controversy. Think of four groups, right? On the left is the restrictive crowd, and that's actually a very few people. I'd say maybe 30 or 40, and these people have dug their heels in, and they get research grants, their reputations, their egos are very invested to the original definition of Lyme disease that goes back to 1975, and it hasn't changed since. Then you have, you have a few extremists that do weird things. They, they do exist. But then you have the classic medical people that do the thorough exam, huge judgment, like Dr. Phillips described, that type of approach. Now that does approximate best the ILADS approach. And ILADS is in that group because we emphasize thoroughness. But it's not just ILADS. Probably most of the people in that group are not from ILADS. But they were able to exercise their judgment. But then you have the vast number of doctors that read one or two articles in New England Journal of Medicine and say, well, this is the way, this is the way it is. And if somebody does more than uh, one dose of doxy from a tick bite, then they're, they're extreme. And the restrictive people kind of categorize anyone who doesn't follow their guidelines as, as extremists when it's not the case. So basically, um, when I do treatment, I focus on the sleep. Uh, basically, if you make the immune system better, reduce stress, reduce the psychiatric symptoms, improve the quality of sleep, your immune system works better. And um, that's basically one of the most critical things, it's very simple. Uh, adaptive immunity occurs in deep sleep, so you want to improve the quality of sleep. And doing that one simple thing helps to fatigue, cognitive impairments, emotional liability, pain sensitivity, but the biggest thing is adaptive immunity. And that's what often we see is that when you're in a state of fatigue, you're half awake, half asleep 24-7. And you want to normalize the circadian rhythm so that you're, when you're asleep, your body's recharging its batteries, and when you're awake, you're alert, you're focused, you don't have the fatigue, and you can focus right. So basically, um, to sum it up, uh, we do see that immune effects are the missing link. Immune effects associated with, with persistent infection that cause a lot of the psychiatric symptoms. And we can piece out each detail, and the devil is in the detail, but these pieces are coming together. And as Sir William Oster, the father of medicine, American medicine, said, he who knows syphilis knows medicine. It can now be said, that to know Lyme disease is to know medicine, neurology, psychiatry, immunology, psychoimmunology, ecology, law, politics, and ethics, all right? Okay, so thanks for your attention, okay?